Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everyone here uh, that's in person, but also anyone um, watching online. We, we have the Facebook Live and we have the um, YouTube live streaming. And I would encourage you to invite people to watch that. You can even forward those to people, and it's an easy way to give out God's Word. But we're going to be in Isaiah 58, and we were going to do it last week. And it was interesting, the battles that occurred right before. Um, we do the live streaming, and the person that we that kind of knows it inside and out um, was out of town traveling. It was actually my son-in-law, my daughter, and um, he was getting ready to set it all up, and then their cell phones went off, and they were literally trailing in the mountains by the redwoods. And so all of a sudden, we're like, and it's, it's not like them to not get a hold of us. And it got to the point where it's like, maybe they went off the road or something. And I, but we didn't have the live streaming, and it just seemed like the Lord was saying to make it a prayer time. And so I was going to do Isaiah 58 last week, but we're going to do it this week. And it is a powerful, powerful chapter um, about what God's looking at. It's one thing to have the appearance of being spiritual and godly, and then there's the reality of whether we are in God's sight. People can think we are, but, what, but the thing is, God knows what we are. And um, it is just a very insightful um, chapter and, and really reveals you know, what God's looking for. And when our hearts are towards him, the blessings that he pours out. And, it, and it's just a wonderful chapter. And so I just want to pray. And, um, you know, it's funny. We hate all the cold and the rain. <laughs> and we want the sun. But, man, this is like, we've got some pretty hot days here. But I still, I'm not going to complain. I'll still take the heat. I just, I think it's with the humidity, you know. It's like you're, you're, you're getting hammered. But anyway, Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for allowing us to be here. And um, Lord, anoint your word. This is such a powerful chapter if we get it. And I'm um, anoint Caleb as he plays and sings. And Lord, as we're singing to you, may it be from our hearts just telling you thank you. Because you are so good. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Good evening. You guys would uh, stand with us as we worship. Christ is my reward and all my devotion. And now there's nothing in this world never satisfy through every trial my soul will sing no turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for me yeah Christ is enough for me my all in all enjoy my salvation and this hope will never fail cause heaven is my home it's through every storm my soul will see Jesus is here God be the glory. Christ is enough for me. Yeah, Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have 
have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before. I 
I can't see when I lose my step fall down again. I can't see because you pick me up. See, because you're there. I can't see because you hear me, Lord, when I call to you in prayer. I can't see with my singing your praise how could I ever say enough how amazing is your love how can I keep from shouting your name I know I'm loved by the King and it may By the key, and it makes my heart want to see, and it makes my heart want to see. Oh, the joy to be, the joy to know it's when I decrease. You fill up my soul, what a joy to see. The joy to hold it's when you increase. I want nothing more. Joy to see 
Joy to hold it when you increase. I want nothing to set me free. Now I live to bring him praise. And now I live to bring him
Jesus, I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender One more time, I surrender. surrender ourselves to you right now, Father. Lord, we just come before you boldly and humbly, Lord, just asking you to fill us, Lord, to teach us your word. Give us understanding, Father. Help us to draw closer to you right now, Lord. I ask that you just fill my dad with your Holy Spirit. Just speak through him. Father, just allow your, the work of your spirit in our hearts tonight. We just want to give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's great to be here. Um, 
Let's see. Well, Wednesday night service, Isaiah, but that was this is Sunday's announcements. Youth night's going on upstairs. Worship and prayer tomorrow at 7, and that is a blessed time, so I'd encourage you to try to make that. Um, this Sunday, homeless meeting, homeless ministry meeting after the second service. Anyone interested in being part of this is welcome to attend, and there's little Ziploc bags. Oh, I was supposed to bring one up here, but I didn't. But they're out there, and, and it has a list, and you can fill. And um, is it supposed to be like the, the travel size stuff or normal size stuff? What's that? Okay, well, he's going to bring something in here. So, so because someone asked me if they're supposed to put travel size, like toothpaste and shampoo and stuff like that, or so travel size. Okay. Um, and just you take the bags and you fill it up. And you bring it back and put it in the box. Um, let's see here. And I think he's about to bring me. I mean, let me show an example. I'll show that real quick. But this homeless ministry is something that's kind of growing, and it's it's real. Blue. Okay, so you, you pick one of these bags up, and then you fill it like this, and it, and there should be a list in there, correct? Yep. All right, very good. And um and then also um and just pray for me, guys um. This weekend is this race that I got to do. And, um, you know, last year, actually, I've already set up the pit area that I'm going to be using. And um, last year, I didn't even come here on a Wednesday. But you know what? I need to be here. I need to do this. I need the Lord to fill me with the Spirit. I, you know, because all the, everything, I think everything apart from Jesus is just a bunch of stress and hassle. And, um, and if I can just... You know, be a light there. That's what makes it worth it. But I'm not going to be a light if I'm not filled with the Lord, and I need to come and do this. But um, the track is offered that you get a free event wristband if you're willing to help out the cleaning. And on Friday and Saturday is the main need, and they pay you $14 an hour. And um, if you're interested in that, stick around, because I, I will give it to anybody, the wristbands, I've got them, and I'll explain to you, you know, where to go, where to be, and... and um. I like it when people from the church are there just because I like people praying for me. And I'm Hope Over Heroin is bringing up about 50 people from Cincinnati, and they're going to be doing actually the, the ushers in the stands. And, um, you know, no one can get workers, and that track has been so desperate. It used to be real easy to get volunteers. And now you can't get people that want to do anything. And so we, we have definitely were a favorable witness to them. And um, I just want to be a light. And um just pray for me, you know, um, that I honor the Lord. It's a new team, a new crew, and um, I just want to be a light to them. I don't know anyone very well, and um, I just don't want to do anything stupid. I don't want to mess up this guy's car, and um, I don't do this a lot. You know, I just saw one of my friends, Josh Hart, there today. He does this every week or every other week, and um, last time I did this was August. And so I just, you know, I know I'm going to be getting just almost sick to my stomach as we lead up to it. So just pray. And um, a couple of years ago, Hope Over Heroin came out, and, and, and all the guys laid hands on me and prayed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow, was that an awesome thing. And I told them, you guys got to do this. When they, they're going to come up Thursday, I want them to pray for me. But anyway, so with that, and so if you're interested, talk to me. If someone's watching online and you want to um, help out, just um, send me a message online, so on Facebook. But with that, we're going to start. So you can open your Bibles to Isaiah 58. And last week, I had prepared this message, and um, we had some problems with the, um, the Wi-Fi and Internet and the live streaming. And it just seemed like the Lord was saying, make it a prayer time, which we did. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to do this message today and not be at the track was um, it's just such a neat chapter. And you know, when you, when you prepare a message, you get kind of ramped up like, man, this is awesome. I can't wait to share this. And then I didn't get to last week. But um, so, you know, basically as an introduction, our world is filled with so many things that are fake, that are false. It can be a product that's inexpensive, but has the appearance of something expensive, some knockoff to rip people off. Um, you can also have, people can be fake in person, but you guys agree online, you can really be fake. You know, people's profiles can be completely disconnected from the reality of the person. And then appearance 
I mean, I've seen where they'll someone will have a video and they'll show watch this filter, and you know, you, you know, I'll tell you what, guys, just the bottom line: I hate social media. I hate all of it. It's the world we're living in. If I can use it to point people to the Lord, I will. But I've seen like like Instagram. You know, it seems like it's 90% girls doing selfies, but they, they do these filters, and, they, and some person even put on there and said, here's what it makes me look like. Here's what I really look like. And I'm like, wow, it, it's, it's all fake. And now I've been reading AI, artificial intelligence. They said that they've got computers where you can go on a website and ask questions, and you would not be able to tell if you're interacting with a person or a computer. And they say AI is, is just advancing so fast. It's almost becoming human, but it's, but it's not. It's fake. And also, in the spiritual realm, you know, we can be fake or we can be real. There are those who truly know God, and he lives through them. He moves through them. It's true in their words, in what they say. It's true in how they live. Sadly, there are people who... Um, have the appearance of knowing God, but yet the way they live contradicts. Um, they profess to know God, but there's no evidence in their actions. And I'm telling empty words. In this chapter, God is speaking to his people about this issue. They had outward religion, but their hearts weren't truly towards him. They went to church, but when they were away from church, they lived differently. And I believe this chapter is a wake-up call for them and for us. And um, on one hand, there's warnings, and, it, and it's, you, know, you can just tell there's an edge to it. I mean, part of the Bible comforts, part of it convicts. But then, you know, God shows what it's like if we truly walk with him, truly follow him. And, uh, man, it's, it's a glorious picture. This chapter ends on just a super high note. So, Lord, open our eyes the reality of the fact that we can have the appearance to people to follow you and yet in our hearts be distant. And Lord, I pray that in our hearts and our minds, our focus would be truly knowing you, truly hearing your voice, following you. And um, Lord, we want to be real. We want you to live through us. And, um, and Lord, if there's, like David prayed, if there's anything in us, any wicked way, anything that's not real, Please show it to us and take it away. Help us to confess it. And, um, Lord, I just ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So it's been a while, few weeks since we've been in Isaiah 58. Um, Israel, as a nation during this time, was in idolatry. The kingdom had been divided. Ten northern tribes, two southern tribes. The northern tribes were already conquered by Assyria because the nation was had turned their back on God. The southern two tribes should have learned from watching you know, big brother, in a sense, get wiped out. They didn't learn. And they were, Isaiah was telling them, within 100 years, Babylon's going to come and wipe them out. And sadly, they ignored the warnings, and it happened. In the midst of idolatry and darkness, there's always a remnant, a few that still have a heart for God. And I mean, how many would say overall our nation's going the wrong direction? But are there people here that want to go the right direction? Yes, there are. And um. To them and to us, God gave a message of hope. He promised Cyrus was going to come and free them. Ultimately, the Messiah would come. Israel's kingdom will be restored. And um, he was basically giving them a future and a hope. Even though, think about this, the people he's talking to weren't going to see those things. But it encouraged them to continue. Hey, is Jesus coming back? Are we going to be with him in his kingdom? Yes. I think it's going to be in our lifetime. But it might not be. But it makes me want to keep following him. Does it make you want to keep following him? It's that hope, okay? And um, the thing is, even in, in what it, those who trusted God would draw near to him, even if they're surrounded by evil. Chapter 54 gave a great picture of God restoring ruined lives. Chapter 55 basically told how he does it and it had to do with hearing his word. Chapters 56 and 57 showed a contrast between those who run to God and those who run away from God. The ones who run away from God, there's no peace. The ones who run to God, there's peace and blessing. And I'm, I'm actually going to begin chapter 58 by reading the end of 57. So go to chapter 57, verse 18. He said, I've seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him um, to his mourners. So he's talking about a time of restoration. Some he'll bring back. 
He says, I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace, peace to him that is afar off and him that is near, says the Lord, I will heal him. So God's reaching out, come back to him. He, there will be peace. But if you rebel, he says, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, to the wicked. So if you live in wickedness, you're never going to find peace. And so then, so here, chapter 58, <clears throat> verse 1, he says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. And he says, Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me ordinance and justice. They take delight in approaching to God. So first of all, he's saying, Isaiah, I want you to cry out. And what is he going to tell them? He's going to show them their sin. Now listen, guys, that's not very popular in our day. If somebody is living in adultery or fornication, or they're a thief, or they're a drunkard, and you say, that's wrong, that's a sin, 99% of the time, what are they going to say back to you? Don't judge me. You know, they want to scratch out the whole Bible and just take one of Jesus' quotes. Jesus said you shouldn't judge. First of all, when Jesus said you shouldn't judge, you're taking it out of context. It had to do with not passing a sentence. You can't pass, pass, you can't pass the sentence on it. But, um, and it's interesting, I heard one quote recently. When someone says, don't judge me, what they're really saying is, let me sin in peace. Isn't that insightful? <laughs> Leave me, you're making me uncomfortable with my sin. And um, I thought that was, and what's interesting though, we are, the Bible tells us to judge. Go to 2 Timothy 3, and I like to, I like to use the Bible to teach the Bible. And so some places I'll quote, but some things I want you to see for yourself. And um, this idea of telling someone they're doing something wrong is part of what we're supposed to do. Um, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that is to what we're to, we're to believe, for reproof. That means refute and actually means suggest shame. You shouldn't do that. That's wrong. That is shameful. I mean, sin, is, it does bring shame. And, um, and then he says, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. So correction, telling them what's the right thing to do, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished under all good works. That's what the Bible does to us. Have you ever been reproved by the Bible? Has it ever told you you're doing something wrong? Now, what's interesting, though, is the Bible does that to us, but now he says, I charge you, therefore, chapter 4, verse 1, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, that will judge the alive and the dead as appearing in his kingdom, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. That means in every situation, bring the Bible. Now notice the next, next word, reprove. So the Bible reproves me, tells me that I'm doing something wrong. I remember I had somebody who once tell me they didn't want to read the Bible because all they ever did was find out what they're doing wrong. I'm like, what do you expect? You know, it's, I don't know if you guys know this, the F-16 is like the most unstable plane ever made. It's called fly-by-wire. It doesn't have cables where you control it directly got a joystick, and it's a computer telling the plane where to go, and it makes a, like a thousand corrections a second. No human could fly it, but you're telling a computer where to send it. It always needs correction, right, left, up, down, forward. How many of you feel like in F-16, you always need correction? Sometimes I'm going ahead, sometimes I sometimes turn right, sometimes stop, sometimes speak, sometimes shut up. And um, But notice, he says, reprove Again, which means suggest shame. What you're doing, that's wrong, that's shameful. Oh, you made me feel guilty. Well, you're guilty. <laughs> you know, when someone says you made me feel guilty, you only feel guilty when you're guilty. If you're guilty, you feel guilty. Rebuke is um, actually to charge sharply. You know, this needs to stop. Exhort is more to encourage and strengthen. Hey, stop doing, the, you know, it could be turning to the bottle, alcohol. You need to stop that. That's ruining your life. Now, the encouragement is, hey, read your Bible every day. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Lord will help you. Somebody should know better than to be calling me. That's my phone over there. So, so somebody doesn't realize it's church going on. Anyway, um, but 
Reprove, rebuke. So here's the thing, guys. You have, and he says, with all long suffering and doctrine, it means being patient. The things we are to judge. Actually, go to 1 Corinthians 5 and um, verse 11. Um, Paul was addressing someone who was committing fornication, and it was a guy basically having sex relationship with his mother in law. And he said it's something that the heathen wouldn't even do. And they were being very, um, they thought it was a great thing that they were being tolerant, okay? And Paul says, like, you need to kick this person out. And then verse 11, look what he says. But now I have written to you not to company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, extortioner, such don't even eat with. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Listen, those in the world are going to sin, okay? He's addressing God's people here, okay? And he says, um, you're to, but do not um, you judge them that are within. You're supposed to judge them that are within. But those that are without, God judge. Therefore, put away from it yourselves the wicked person. So, you know, Isaiah's talking to God's people. When I'm talking to other Christians, there's things they can say that are right and wrong. And, um, you know, the lost, the world, what do they need? What's the answer for them? They need Jesus, okay? And that's why they're sinning. But, um, but see, again, Christians... You know, so so often there's this. We don't want to be held accountable, and so you can tell some, you can tell an action is wrong. Lying is wrong all the time. Theft is wrong all the time. Murder is wrong all the time. Sex outside of marriage is wrong all the time. Drunkenness is wrong. It's a sin. Drugs, gossip, um, they're all wrong. And what's interesting is in Matthew seven, Jesus talking about false prophets, and he said, "You'll know them by their fruits." So they appear, they say one thing. But the evidence in their life says something else. So how are they living? You have to make a judgment to determine that. And so specifically back in Isaiah 58, what is their sin? What is the issue that he's going to point out now? Verse 2, he says, you seek me daily and delight to know my ways. So they had the appearance that they wanted to follow God. They went to church. They went to Bible studies, okay? But, but the, and he goes on, he says, as a nation that did righteousness, as a nation, it doesn't say they were one. So they had the appearance. You know, and it says in 2 Timothy 3, 5, they have a form of godliness, but deny the power. In the last days, the churches are going to have people in it. But, the, but denying the power is the word power to them, the power of the Holy Spirit. They're not people who are born again, filled with God's spirit. They're religious. And he says, and forsook not the ordinance of their God. So you look like people are doing the right thing and not forsaking God, but actually you are forsaking God. They ask um, of me ordinances of justice. They, they delight in approaching God. They look like they want to follow him. And that kind of reminds me of a church um, in the last days. And it's interesting, too, guys. I want to throw something out here. And I read this once. They said, sometimes we substitute knowing for doing. You can read books on prayer. There's a lot of good books on prayer. But what's the best way to learn how to pray? Praying. I mean, I've read some really good books on prayer. But man, but you know what? You get alone with God or you pray with his people, that's when you experience the power. You can read books on evangelism. But that doesn't count as evangelizing. You can know everything about evangelism. But you know what you got to do? You got to tell someone your faith. If you don't tell someone your faith... The books don't mean anything. You can, you can read and learn about giving and loving and serving. But like J. Vernon McGee would say, you've got to put it in shoe leather. You've got to give. You've got to show God's love. And um, go to um, Revelation 3. I believe here's a perfect modern last days picture of what was going on in Isaiah's day. And they had the appearance, but something was missing. And I think this is one of probably of the three most troubling passages in the Bible. I think the most troubling is when Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord's going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he'll say, have we, you know, depart from me, I never knew you. Imagine dying, thinking you know Jesus, and then you stand before him and you don't know him. How many of you say that's got to be the worst thought, right? How many of you would say, if you don't know him right now and you think you do, you want God to show you that? I, I want to know now, okay? That's a troubling passage. But here's another one. Revelation 3, 14. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And Laodicea means rights of the people. <laughs> and man, is our day just all about the people's rights? 
you know, and that's all, and it's like, man, I know thy works that you're not cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So either say you're a Christian and live all out for Jesus, or don't say you're a Christian. Lukewarm is you say you're a Christian, but you live like the world. There's a contradiction there. And he says, so then because you're lukewarm, either cold or hot, I will, spe- I will vomit you out of my mouth. And then notice the issue. He puts his finger right on it. Because you say, and they're looking, they're measuring their assessment of their relationship with God on material things. I am rich, I increase with goods, I need of nothing. So it was probably a church that had built a big building, a lot of money, and prosperity. But then he says, know us not. Don't you know? Don't you realize this? And so they didn't realize this. They thought everything was fine. But here's Jesus' assessment, and this is scary. Oh, man. How many of you say, if this is you, you want him to, you want to see it now? Don't you know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? That's very troubling. See, here's the biggest problem with this church. They could not see themselves the way Jesus saw them. And see, the only way you can keep that from happening is by looking at this book. This book is a mirror. And when you look in it, I've heard someone say the Bible is the only book that reads you. And when you read it, the Holy Spirit will shine a light on you and show you what God sees. How many you realize that there could be someone who has character flaws and they're blind to them? Is that possible? And you probably got wives, elbowing husbands there. And um, the only way you become aware of your character flaws is reading God's word. Well, Laodicea could not have been in God's word. They were going through the motions, they were religious, and they weren't reading their Bibles, and they thought everything was fine. How many of you say this sounds like our day? Isn't it common? It says in the last days they weren't in their sound doctrine. They won't want the Bible. And he's like, counsel you, buy me gold, try in the fire, give up the material things, and, and take on some trials that you may be rich. White raiment that you may be clothed. That's what you're given when you're saved. Um, and the shame of your nakedness does not appear. And I know your eyes are the eyes saved that you may see. That's the Holy Spirit. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent, meaning I'm telling you hard things because I love you. And as Christians, we should want to hear the hard things. And then a verse that's used for salvation, a picture of salvation, but it's amazing. It's talking to a church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is on the outside. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me, meaning a relationship will begin. Lord, I'm opening my heart. I'm putting my trust in you. Come in. And it's between you and him. That's where it begins. It was, the last day's church is a church where he's on the outside. But anyway, so go back to um, Isaiah 58. And so Israel, they had the appearance, but it wasn't real. And then wherefore have we, why have we fasted, say they, and you don't see? Um, wherefore have we afflicted our soul and you take no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of the wickedness of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. So first of all, guys, fasting has a place, right? Jesus, when he was talking about it, he says, when you fast, not if you fast. And um, are Christians to read their Bibles? Yep. Well, you don't have to, but you should. Are we to pray? Yes, you don't have to, but you should. Fasting is the same way. Are, are we to give? You don't have to, but you should. Well, you don't have to fast, but you should, and there's a benefit to it. The issue is, is the motive. And um, God did not all acknowledge their fasting because they were doing it to be seen. And um, go to Matthew 6. And, and the issue is the motive. And, my, and here, here's a little principle, guys. What would you rather be? Would you rather appear spiritual or actually be spiritual? You know what I'm saying? You can do things and people think, oh, look how, look how holy that person is. And we, you know, you know something, guys. Here's something funny. Our flesh likes praise and likes to think it's holy. <laughs> it wants the appearance, and um, and so in Matthew six verse sixteen, Jesus says, "Moreover, when you fast, not if, but when, don't be as the hypocrites that make sound sad countenance and disfigure their faces that they appear men to fast. Where they say, do they have their reward? They look all sad and weak. What's the matter, brother?" Oh, I'm fasting. I've been, you know, well, if they're doing it for that reason, then it's of no value. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, 
that you appear not unto men to fast, but unto your Father which sees in secret, and your Father which sees in secret to reward you openly. So I'm doing it unto the Father, not for man. I will tell you this, though. If I decide I'm going to fast, I mean, nobody will offer to buy me lunch or dinner or give me food, but if I'm going to do like a three-day fast or a five-day fast or a seven-day fast, I promise you, somebody I'll be out, hey, can I buy you lunch, brother? You know, and we've had we've had meals served on Sunday, and there's been times. I remember one time specifically, I was in the middle of a fast. I don't want to tell anybody. And this person brought the nicest plate of food and just went, "Here," you know. It's like now, what do you do? Do you offend them and not eat it? What do you tell them? Oh, I can't tell you. It's like, but you want food offered to you? Decide you're going to fast, and somebody's going to offer you food. But anyway, and the thing is, and if you say in that case, if you say no, I'm fasting, I don't believe I'm doing it for to be seen. Sometimes you just got to, or you're just going to have to eat it and fast another day. But um, but what's interesting, back in Isaiah 58, he says they fast for their own pleasure, meaning it was for their glory. They wanted recognition, and it was to mistreat people, arguing, fighting. It, it produced a religious pride in them. And that's where he talks about where they'll um, smile with a fit of, fit, fist of wickedness. Um, a classic picture of this kind of fasting is in Luke 18. And there's a guy that Jesus addresses, and you can, it just exudes the spiritual pride. And um, Luke 18, 10, it says, he spoke um, a certain parable unto them, look at this, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous, meaning they thought they were good enough on their own. And look at this, and despised others. Look at verse 9 of Luke 18. He spoke this parable to certain which trusted that they were righteous, and they despised others. If you think you're super holy and you're despising people, there's a problem. If I'm holy and close to God, my heart's going to break for people. I'm not going to despise people. And he says, two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, meaning nobody was listening. God, I thank you that I'm not as other men, our extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this publican. Can you guys, is it exuding off the page like it is to me, an attitude that we don't want to have, okay? I fast twice in a week. I give tithes to all I possess. It's like, oh, look at me, God. Does this make anybody else feel sick to their stomach, reading this? How many of you don't want to be like this? And it's, it's a scary thing. It can happen. And, 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 and he's, he's, he, he was doing these things, but it gave him an elevated view, and his attitude was mistreating people. I'm telling you guys, I don't care what you do for the Lord. If you're mistreating people, something's wrong, okay? I can be involved with ministry and have all these endeavors, and if I'm nasty to people, that just stops me. And sometimes, how many of you have been trying to serve the Lord and you get nasty with the people closest to you? Anybody ever got nasty with a spouse or children? Anybody ever have that happen? And I was fighting it today. I was doing some stuff with the, the race, and I'm... Got some of my boys helping me, and they, Mikey and Dave are doing really good, and I'm so grateful for them, and I'm thankful that they were helping me in the heat. And we were putting something together, and there was a couple points where I was starting to get like, and I'm like, man, I cannot be like this. I cannot do this. If I'm going to be nasty, just throw it all away. None of it's worth anything, and it's a flag. But the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift up his eyes to heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He felt so bad. He wasn't looking down on anybody because he thought he was the lowest. That's when you're in the right place. Look what Jesus said. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. It means innocent rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. I don't know about you guys. When I read that, I just want to go, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because what's funny is I feel like the Pharisee <laughs> sometimes. Anybody ever feel like the Pharisee? And it's like, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he, that's the whole point. He's trying to deal with that attitude that we don't have it, and it should convict us of us there. And um, anyway, so go back to Isaiah 58. And um, he goes on, he says, um, at the end of verse 4, don't fast this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Listen, fasting doesn't make God hear you. You're not twisting his arm to do your will. Prayer is to get God's will done. Listen, here's something else, guys. Listen closely. Fasting is not for God. Fasting is for us. If you read in Galatians, it talks about, listen, the flesh and the spirit are warring, okay? The flesh is your sinful nature in this body. 
this body wants what it wants when it wants it all the time, right? When you get irritated with people, it's because they're getting away of your flesh, of your selfishness. The spirit is what's from God. It wants to say no to the flesh, give up what you want, let go of your life to God. And they're battling each other. Our tendency is to feed the flesh. How many of you ate good today? Everybody eat pretty good today? We get up, we eat, we take showers, we take care of this part really good. But the spirit part, we need to read our Bibles, we need to sit at God's feet, we need to pray, we need to walk in the spirit, we need to worship. We neglect that part of us. And if we're always feeding the flesh and neglecting the spirit, when those two battle, it's like two dogs fighting. The one that you feed is going to win. And if you're only feeding the flesh, then you're going to come to a place where, oh, should I look at that you know, X-rated movie or should I lie or steal or lose my temper? And the flesh will keep winning and you'll keep doing the wrong thing and, the, and your spirit will be weak. You know, you ever seen the analogy where it's, you know, the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other? Just change it. It's the spirit and it's the flesh. Anybody here feel like you're pulled in two ways sometimes? Oh, I need to read my Bible. Oh, I'm so tired. You know, I need to get up and pray. I want to sleep or I want to watch a movie. And it's like you're constantly being battled. Well, fasting, if you say I'm going to fast, what it does, it automatically weakens this. The flesh gets weaker. And the spirit rises up. It doesn't change God. It changes me. And when the spirit is stronger, what does it say? The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. One of the fruits of the spirit is faith. The things of God get real clear. The flesh makes the things of God cloudy. It's kind of like going down an old dusty road in an old pickup truck and the windshield's covered with dirt. And you hit the windshield wipers and it cleans it off and you can see clear. The flesh makes it hard for us to see God. And I'm telling you, and, and I will tell you this too, I wish it wasn't so. But fasting makes the things of God very clear. And um, a matter of fact, when I fast and pray, I see things happen that never happen when I just pray. I don't like it, and I wish it wasn't so. But I think what it is is when you're fasting, the faith part increases, and um, it weakens the flesh, and um, and the things of God become more real. And um, verse verse five, he says, "Is," and then he goes on now. Um, you know, he says, is, is this such a fast that I've chosen a day for him to afflict his soul, to bow down his head as a bulrush? What he's saying here is, God doesn't get some special thrill about you suffering. It's like, well, if I'm miserable enough, then maybe God will help me. And that's not what it is. God's not saying, I don't get some joy out of that. Should we fast? Yes. Should we say no to the flesh? Yes. Okay. But it's not because God wants to see us suffer. It says he wants, here's the thing, God does not want your flesh to be the ruler. Do you realize that? You know, when God created Adam, the spirit was on top. The soul, that's you, makes the choices, and the body was on the bottom. When they sinned, the spirit part died. It flipped. The body became uppermost. What's the first thing they noticed? Hey, where's our clothes? They didn't even realize they didn't have clothes. They were so conscious of God. And see, that's how we're to be. And God doesn't want the flesh ruling you. Now, there are different kinds of fasts. There's a Daniel fast where you don't eat, like, desserts, wine, or meat. Um, you can do a food-only fast, and you can, you, know, you can technically go like 40 days without food. Um, most I've gone is like 10. You can, after about three days, hunger leaves. By four or five days, I actually feel great. It just, it's, it's so hard to get to that point. <laughs> the first three days are the hardest. But you, know, you can do one meal and just read your Bible instead. You can go one day and then eat in the evening. The hardest battle initially is not eating all day, and then going to sleep the next morning. See, it's so hard to go to sleep hungry, man. That, that is the battle, and um, that, that's the killer. And, um, but then you can do a two-day, three-day, whatever. Um, you can do food and water. That only, you can only do about three or four days. You know, it's interesting. If you don't drink water, you're not hungry. You're thirsty, because thirst is a greater need than hunger. The point is, you can, I've heard of people doing fast of social media and the Internet, you know, you're putting things aside. You're saying no to the flesh. And um, I think when you, it's a good discipline to do. You know, ideally, I'd like to fast one day a week, once a month, three days. Once a year, I do like seven to ten days. That's kind of what I've tried to follow. Um, but when there's a big decision, and you don't know what to do, and you've got to hear from God, fast. Um, if you want revival, 
If you feel like you're drifting and you just need God to light a fire in you, you know what? Fast. It, it, it really makes a difference. But now look at verse 6. He's saying, now he says, is not this the fast I've chosen? So here's what God wants fasting to be about. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke. So it has to do with spiritual bondage. Listen, guys, there is something that happens in the spirit. Jesus talks about whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, or whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. How many of you know people that the devil is just destroying their life? We can pray that God binds the devil. How many of you know people that are slaves of the devil and to sin? I already pray that you free him. And fasting does something. Go to um, Matthew 12. And I want you to see where Jesus brings this up. And um, I do know there are some versions of the Bible actually leave out the word fasting. But, um, but um, King James has it. Matthew 12, verse 24. And um, when the Pharisees heard that they said this, uh, this fellow does this, cast out demons by Beelzebub. Um, Jesus knew their thoughts and said, every kingdom that's divided against itself is brought to desolation. And he said, every city or house that's divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How can his kingdom stand? If I be Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, there'll be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. How can a man enter in a strong man's house and spoil his goods except that he first bind the strong man? And so the whole point is, is that a lot of times there's spiritual warfare and we want to pray that the, the devil is bound. Now, you know what? I made a mistake here and I meant to put a reference and I didn't, um, where the disciples could not cast out a demon. And he said, why couldn't we cast it out? And he says, this, he says it was your unbelief. And he says, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. Not this kind of demon, it's this kind of faith. When you're in a spiritual battle and, and it's like, God, I need your help, you got to move. Fasting increases our faith. And that's, I'm telling you guys, it's hard to explain, but, um, and I, I love the place I'm in spiritually when I'm fasting. I just hate fasting. <laughs> Anybody relate to this? <laughs> your spirit soars. And, um, and that's why it needs to be a part of our lives. But anyway, so go back to um, Isaiah 58. Um, but, um, he says, is not this a fast that I, uh, is not, is it not to deal thy bread of the hungry? So first, verse six is spiritual warfare. Seeing people set free. If you're gonna fast and pray, you're praying for somebody else's benefit. That's verse six. But notice also, is it not to deal your bread to the hungry? Hey, sacrifice a little bit. Give up something for someone else. And it's not just food. It could be your time. And um, it could be money that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house. When you see the naked, that you cover him, that you hide not yourself from your own flesh. And so here, it's the idea that you're giving and wanting to help people. And um, you know, guys, God doesn't just bless us for us. He wants it to flow into us and through us. And this kind of brings up the sheep and the goats. Remember Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. Thirsty, you gave me a drink. Sick, you know, you visited me. Naked, you clothed me. Well, when do we do this for you, Lord? When you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Now, I don't think he's teaching works righteousness. I believe what he's teaching is if you're a sheep and you're really a sheep, you're going to care about people. And so, you know, look what he says here in verse 7. You know, when you see the naked, do you give them clothes? You know, when you see the poor that are cast out, you know, what do you do? You know, and don't hide from meaning your own relatives. You know, and actually, um, Timothy talks about, First Timothy, he says that if you don't help those in your own house, you deny the faith. And um, Proverbs 19, 17 says, he who gives and pities the poor lends to the Lord and God will repay him. Think about that for a second. You see somebody hurting and someone in need? I don't know about you guys. I can't just walk away from them. And if I can help, I'm going to help. And it may not be just on the street. It could be, I, mean, I remember watching years ago, Hurricane Hugo. One time it was the worst, then Andrew became the worst, then Katrina. But it was Myrtle Beach, I think. And a month, two months later, they showed whole families in gymnasiums 
Now just stop and think. What if you were in a gymnasium with about 20 families with kids running around and you had to sleep on the floor and no privacy and you had no home? How many say that'd be pretty miserable? Would that be miserable? And I'm like, gosh, this is horrible. I can't believe this. I want to do something. And Lord's like, do something. I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? He just said, do something. I'm like, I don't know what to do. So I called somebody and said, I think we're supposed to help them. And you know, well, this guy says, well, I'll pay, you know, I'll provide a truck. Someone else said, I'll provide gas. This other lady was on a radio station. I'll put it on the radio. In a week, we had two trucks filled with stuff going down there to give to people. And I'm telling you, I could sit here and tell you 10 supernatural stories from that one trip. And all it started with was a, you know, we got to do something. But when you give to the poor, someone hurting in need, the Lord's when it pays you back. And what did Jesus say in Luke 6, 38? He says, give, it'll give it be given back to you. Press down and running over will people give to your bosom. See, get the picture. Everything, how many, you guys realize everything you have is from God? Everything, right? It isn't, okay, Lord, I gotta give you a tenth, you know? No, no, I gotta give you all of it. Forget the tenth thing, give God everything. I'm a steward. You give to me, where do you want it to go? Some of it's for my needs, but not all of it. Some of it's for others. When I'm faithful, giving to others and using it, because some people, when they get wealth, it keeps increasing. What do they do? They raise their standard of living, right? They get bigger houses, bigger cars, bigger needs. That's not how it's supposed to be. Yes, God will meet your needs, but there comes a point you start giving to others. You know what? God will start putting more in your hands. And I've watched this. I have one of my sponsors um, um, that he's a Christian guy, and he just gives and gives and gives, and he's like Solomon. He gets a business. He is so smart with making money. He's brilliant. But he, he could live 10 times what he has. I'm tempted to say his name, but I don't want to embarrass him. But he's a really neat sponsor. He'll be at the race on Sunday. But he's just one of the most giving guys I've ever seen. And he, he actually supports... Um, a school in Africa, an orphanage. He's, he's like the sole supporter of this thing. But see, when you're doing that, when you're constantly giving, then, then God will give to you. And I think that's the secret to life. Give your time, give your money, um, give your skills to God, to people, to lost souls. You know, when I was um, seeing Anna, my daughter just got married, and um, she's living not just Mexico. I mean, Mexico itself is for the most part, a step down economically. She's in a Oaxaca Indian colony in Mexico. The Mexicans look at them as dirt poor. And, um, and she's so happy. And I look at what she has, I'm like, Lord, this is so hard. I, first of all, I thank God for a daughter who's not caught up in selfies and Instagram, and, and that's all she cares about. She really wants to help people. And, and, and her husband is a neat guy, and he's so faithful, hardworking, you know, and, um, and he loves the Lord, wants to teach his word. And I remember laying in bed going, Lord, why did you, you know, <laughs> why am I leaving my daughter here? And he's, and he's like, the Holy Spirit said, because I want you to help down here. Because I was, my wheels are already turning and when I'm going back. I mean, she's got a house he's building. It's no bigger than that lobby right there. And it's not only one room, it's got drywall. The rest is studs. And I'm like, I can come and buy some drywall. <laughs> I, I want to go there when it's snow and zero degrees here. We'll go there and spend a week and work on stuff. But I, but I felt like the Lord said he wants me to be involved. And, you know, it's interesting when he says, bring the poor to your house. You know, here's a question. Have you ever let a non-relative live with you? You know, when my dad died when I was 15, I moved to Southern California, and I lived with two non-Christian families. Let me live with them one a year each. And so, you know, I've always had a heart for people. I know where to go. And over the years, since the church started here in Cleveland, Sheila and I have had 14 people live with us, some as short as two weeks, some as long as two years. And, um, you know, giving clothes, you know, whatever the need, if you can see a need, and actually, um, notice he says, hide not from your own flesh. Um, it says in 1 Timothy 5.8 that if you don't take care of your own relatives, you know, somebody in the church here comes to me, their need and maybe their brother or mother or someone or dad goes here, hey, they should help you first. If you're not willing to help your own family, something's wrong. But some people don't take care of their children or their spouse or their parents. But um, well, you know what's interesting is what happens when you get your eyes off yourself and you start reaching the lost and reaching for the hurting and poor people? 
what's going to happen is God's going to open up heaven. You know, it's great to be blessed, but it's better to be a blessing. I still remember my favorite quote of my mom. She lived with us the last eight months before she died, but she, um, um, she was going on a senior retreat. And she was old, but there was people older than her. And she said, Mike, I prayed that God would make me a blessing. And she was. And then she started telling me after the trip all the people that were saying to her. And I thought, what a, you know, if you, if you walk into this building, you can walk in here and say, Lord, bless me. That's one prayer. And he, he'll bless you. You can walk in and say, Lord, make me a blessing to someone else. And listen, guys, that's what I've prayed for the last 30 years. I don't walk in here seeking a blessing. I walk in here saying, Lord, make me a blessing to someone else. And you know, it's great to be blessed, but what did Jesus say? It's more blessed what? To, when you look to be the one giving, you know, there's another joy, another level of joy that comes. And so look at verse 8. When you do this, look at verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. You know, let go of yourself. Quit making the selfish decisions. Start, do something that's hard. Do something that's cost. Go on a mission trip. You know, go, go, go help in the toddler room. Do something that's, that actually causes you to have a battle or a struggle where it's hard. See, we're living in, a, in an age of ease and comfort. No, no, no. Do things that are hard. Then shall your light spring forth as the morning and your health spring forth speedily. Meaning if you become a vessel God's going to use, he's going to keep you healthy. He wants to use you. And he says, and your righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rearward. And you know what's funny, guys? Not just me. This church, like this building, from day one, we shouldn't even have this building. When we, when we met the owner of this building, the first thing he said was, I don't own anything on this. I don't need the money. And I think God wants you in here. Tell me what you want to give me for it. And we gave him half of what it was worth. He gave us a great deal. And the Lord just told me the building is to serve the people, not the people serve the building. Sometimes churches, people, get caught up in the what? The building. The building is serving a purpose. But it's not just to be a blessing to us. It's to be a blessing to this whole city and other ministries. There's probably been 20 different ministries that have used, if someone calls up and said, hey, I need to have this outreach or this gathering, and you know, we don't have any place to go, can we use your building? As long as they're not a cult or teach something weird, okay, as long as they're Christian, okay, and there's, sure. And I've never, ever said you have to give us a penny. You go to any other church and ask to use their building, you know what you're going to hear? Almost every, probably 99% of the time, it's going to cost you this. I've never asked for a dime. Now, they may say, hey, we want to help you. We're going to give you some money. That's fine. That's great. But I'm never going to ask for it. And the thing is, when you have the attitude of you just want to give, Man, oh man, it's like the Lord's gonna. We, like I said, we, we, there's like five ministries renting from us, and they're only paying a fraction of what it's worth. Okay, and the only reason is, look, guys, you know, this ain't my building, you know, and, and it costs money, and they help us. But um, it's interesting. Jesus said, you, "You'll be the light of the world. Let your light so shine that they'll glorify your Father. But your light will shine. You know, He'll lift you up." And um. And I mean, he, hold on, he, what does his name say? He says, um, your health spring forth speedily, your righteousness shall go before you. Um, you know, I think there's physical and spiritual health. He enables you to do more than you think you can do. Notice he says, your righteousness um, shall go before you. I think that's your reputation. If you're someone who's giving and serving God, word gets out. And, I've, and, and because we've done those things, I'll run into someone who maybe has heard about us or here, and they'll, there's a reputation of standing up for the Lord. How many of you want to have a reputation of walking with God? And people are going to see what you're about before you even get there. And then notice he says, the glory of the Lord will be your rear word, meaning God's goodness. You'll leave a trail of God's goodness behind you wherever you go. <laughs> and what that means is God's going to be glorified. And... Um, you know, I want to see Jesus lifted up, and I want to see people touched. And every time I come in contact with them, with somebody, I want to see God move in their life. I want to look back and see blessings. How many of you want to see that? There's nothing better than that. And look at verse 9. Then shall you call, and the Lord shall answer. Oh, so when you're focusing on others, living for God's will and his glory, you know, he's, he's going he's gonna to answer. Um, you'll cry, and he'll say, here I am. Let that sink in for a second. 
it's almost like God saying, I'll be like a servant to you. No, God's not a servant. But when you're doing the right thing, what it's showing is God's attitude is, I'm going to be right here helping you every step of the way. And I'm telling you guys, you know, just going out with Anna's wedding, there was so many logistics. You know, Sheila and the kids flew separate. I had to fly space available. And there was just so many different things where it's like, okay, Lord, help me get on this plane. Help this, help that. And I can tell you guys over and over and over, when I would ask, God would do it. He would just do it. And um, it's, you can live this with a very real sense of God's helping hand when you're doing his will. If you do your own will, you're not going to see that. Matter of fact, it's going to be the opposite. But when you're in his will doing what he wants, it's like, okay, Lord, I got this problem here. And man, he just steps right in and fixes it. And I've, I've witnessed this. And um, I've seen it as a dad of 14 kids. I've seen it with 20 grandkids, planting a church, being a pastor 30 years. I'm seeing it in the drag racing and um, it's an overflow. It's a letting go of your life for others. And man, oh man, it, 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 there is no better life. You know, and um, he goes on, he says, um, hold on here. And then this is actually, hold on, wait a minute. I, I turned the wrong page. Wait a minute. Here's verse nine. Hold on. Oh, there it is. And so... Um, Verse 9, then shall you call, and the Lord shall answer. He'll say, here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking of vanity. And so what he's talking about there is that, um, you know, it's basically what you're not to do. And um, when he says, hold on here, take away from the midst of you the yoke. Okay, so I'm supposed to be living for people. I'm looking to God to help me. But the yoke is when you're putting a trip on people, manipulating them to do what you want. I can put pressure on people. I can manipulate them. I could try to get something to happen. And I can put people on a guilt trip. Has that ever happened in churches before? I mean, you guys think pastors and ministries have ever pressured people and guilt them? I want to tell them the truth. I want to point them to the Lord. But I, have not, I, want, to put some, I don't want to put my yoke on them. Okay? So, you know, he says, um, take away from me the... The, in the midst of the, the yoke, the putting forth the finger. And it's like the accusing, putting down, manipulating people, and I'm telling them what to do. And, and the speaking of vanity ultimately is you're, you're speaking your own words, you're not speaking God's. I don't want to manipulate anyone or tell anyone to do anything except what God wants them to do. And, um, and I can say with a clear conscience, guys, that if I, if I tell you you should read your Bible, it's because I know it's good to read your Bible and I do it. I tell you, you should come to prayer. I'm telling you because there's a joy in coming to prayer. I'm not pressuring you and manipulating you. It's a blessing. If I tell you you should share your faith or give or serve, I'm telling you guys because it's awesome. You know what I mean? But it's not to manipulate. And in verse 10, he goes on, if you draw out your soul to the hungry. Draw out, I think, is, I think what he's saying is if you truly care. And listen, guys, let's make a shift here. Not just hunger for food. I mean, you'd say there's a spiritual hunger. Are there people out there lacking God's word and God's truth? There's people starving to death spiritually. Do you care about people that are lost? And he says, satisfy the afflicted soul. You know, when you're helping people, you know, does it break your heart that people are hurting and lost and empty? And, um, you know, afflicted means downcast and depressed. Satisfied is to fill. So it could be physical need like food, but I think it's even more. And he says, and if you're focusing on reaching out to others, physically and spiritually, and here's the thing, Jesus met the physical need, but what was his real concern? The spiritual need, the truth. When they started coming for the food only, what stopped? The food stopped, because the spiritual is the greater need. And he goes on, if, you're, if you become focused on reaching out and giving to people for the Lord, then shall your light rise in obscurity. Obscurity means darkness, meaning Hey, no one notices me. No one sees me. No one cares about me. Well, you know what? Start pointing people to the Lord. Start laying your life down. And here's what's going to happen. God is going to lift you up as an example. And he says, you're darkness as the noonday. You know, it says in Philippians 2. Actually, go to Philippians 2. This is, this is a good one here, guys. Um, and this is how we're to be. If you're faithful in giving out the things the Lord's given you is truth, 
Here's what he's going to do in your life. Um, Philippians 2, 14, hold on. Wait a minute. He says, um, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Don't be a complainer or a whiner. That ye may be blameless, harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And are, are we in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation? Among whom you what? Shine as lights in the Lord. Look at this, holding forth the word of life. Imagine we're in this dark hurricane storm and people are lost at sea and you're the lighthouse. You're holding Jesus up. And, um, and that's what we want to be. And so go back to him. Um, Isaiah, he says, um, your light will shine as noonday. And he says, and the Lord shall guide thee continually. Let that sink in. And I, I'm telling you guys, I feel like I live this. I feel like he's constantly guiding me. Because you know what my prayer is? I sit here and I say, Lord, I just want your will. Even, listen, during worship, I'm sitting here. The next three days are so overwhelming in my mind. I just said, Lord, I just want your will. I'm letting go of all of it. I have no idea what's going to happen. I just want your will. And you know what, guys? I started getting this radical peace. How many believe if all he wants God's will, he's going to step in and move? And you know what? And, and I can let go of it. And, and he says, and he'll satisfy your soul in drought. So I don't care if the world's in famine and darkness. Guys, we can be satisfied our soul. It's not just food. It's spiritual. I can have joy and peace. And look at this. He says, and make fat your bones. And again, I don't think this is talking about physical food. I think he's talking about just blessing your soul. And look at this. You'll be as a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Jesus said, um, if anyone thirsts, come to me and drink. He says, my spirit will be like a well of water springing up in everlasting life. And he spoke of the Holy Spirit. And so when I am, see guys, it isn't the water just to flow to me got to flow through me. Some people don't have the water flowing in. They don't read their Bibles. They don't pray, and they're, they're dried up. They're like a desert, dirt. But there's others. Water comes in, but it doesn't go out, and it gets stagnant, and it's kind of like rotten water. You want water that goes in and goes out, flows in, flows out. And he says, when it's flowing out, he's saying, you're going to be like on the inside. And again, guys, this water, the Holy Spirit, it's love, joy, peace, and it's so great when it just flo the Lord flows through you. And that's why, like I said, I needed to be here today. Because when I am here, God's filling me and speaking to me, but it flows through me. Okay? And that's, there's nothing better than that. I have to do that. And he says, um, where are we at here? Verse 12. He says, and they that be of thee, so not just you, but the people you impact that are around you, and I can apply this to the church, shall build the old waste places. That means they're going to restore ruined lives. It will raise up the foundations of many generations. So think of the generations. It could be kids, adults, the parents, whatever. You're going you're to transform lives. You're going to see families restored. You'll be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of paths to dwell in, meaning you're going to be known as somebody who's fixed lives. Guys, you know what? As cool as the racing is, it's, it is so non-existent satisfaction compared to if so I've had people call me and say, hey, Mike, I, and I, I saw you. I looked up your Bible studies. I had turned my back on God. Now I'm walking with the Lord. I'm listening to your messages. That right there, guys, is just off the charts. That's what it's all about. And he says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord and honorable. He says, you'll honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasures, nor speaking your own words. Now, here's the thing, guys. The Sabbath, it says, was a covenant between God and Israel. I'm not Jewish. I'm not Israel. It wasn't between me and God. It was between God and Israel. He says that point blank. That's what the Sabbath is. It was a sign. And Acts, and I say this because some Christians try to put Christians under, under the law and under the Sabbath. In Acts, when they're trying to decide what part of the law the Gentiles should follow, they said, don't have sex outside of marriage, don't eat, stay away from idols, and things strangled. They didn't bring up the Sabbath at all. Hebrews 4 talks about ultimately the Sabbath being Jesus. It says, he who's entered God's rest has ceased from his own works. The Sabbath is a picture. Six days work, seventh day rest. We labor under sin. But now, because of the gospel, we're free from sin. How many of you are free from sin? You believe in Jesus? Jesus is our rest. And see, the proof of that 
Um, Romans 14, it says, one man esteems one day above another. Oh, the Sabbath is a special day. Another esteems every day alike. That's me. I think every day is the Lord's day. How many of you want to serve the Lord every day, not just once a week? And so the Sabbath, Jesus is our Sabbath. But the, the issue that he's bringing up here is, is they, on God's day, they were doing their own thing. And so the issue is, look, quit living for yourself, doing your own pleasure, speaking your own words. You need to live for the Lord. And God needs to be, you know, first. And notice verse 14, then shall you delight yourself in the Lord when you're putting him first. You know, guys, I, I said this recently to somebody. There are people who God is a part of their life. Then there's people who God is their life. And there's a difference. You know, guys, Jesus is my life. You know, people have work, they have sports, and then they got God over here. He gets a little part of it. You know what? Since I was 16 years old, the Lord's my life. And um, then you'll delight yourself in the Lord. And he says, I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. You're not, you know, it says you're seated in heavenly places in Christ. You know, if you ask somebody how you're doing, and they go, what are the circumstances? You know, guys, you're not under the circumstances. If you walk with the Lord, you're above the circumstances. And you'll ride upon the high places of the earth, and he'll feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. You know, it's a place of blessing, and you're going to inherit the blessings. And, um, you know, when you sum this up, you know, this chapter is about letting go of your life, dying to yourself. You know, Jesus said, unless a seed falls to the ground and die, it abides alone, but if it die, it brings forth much fruit. When you let go of your life for others, that's when fruit comes up. And it's choices, it's decisions. And I think if you want to sum it up real simple, Matthew 6, 33, what does it say? Seek ye first. The kingdom of God is righteousness. All these things will be added to you. We spent all our time worrying about all the other stuff. Make the Lord the priority. Live for him and then look for ways of giving away his life to people. And I'll tell you something, guys. I feel like the Lord's been telling me this church, he wants us to be about reaching the lowest, the nobodies, the sheep and the goats, the homeless, the poor, the drug addicts, you know, the most hurting people. Because I don't know about you guys. I see, Like you said, when I, I saw... You know, in that Oaxaca Indian tribe, just, man, how little they have. And it's like, Lord. You know, and some of that, we complain. <laughs> about, do you guys realize we, a lot of times we don't always appreciate what we have? And you, especially you go to the mission to Mexico and you see these orphans who have nothing and they have joy. And it's like, Lord, you know, help me to see things the way you see them. You know what? He sees people as the most valuable thing. And I want to reach the lowest, most hurting, and, um, and I want to care about them. And I want it to be real, not just the appearance. And that's what we kind of started with. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. Lord, there's a lot in this message that's convicting because we can be about outward things and drift from you in our hearts. And Lord, um, but that's, if we're honest, like the publican, and say, Lord, have mercy on us, a sinner, Lord. We do fall short. We don't want to be like the Pharisee. We don't want to be just religious outwardly and look down on others. We want to have our hearts break for others. Lord, help us to draw out our souls to the poor. Help us to do things for people that are hurting. Even this week, Lord, I know you're telling me this weekend is not about racing. It's about people. Anyone I come in contact with, it's about being a servant, being kind, whether it's my own kids, whether it's this crew, whether it's fans, whoever, other racers, Lord, help me show your kindness and your love. Lord, help us never to put stuff, material things ahead of people. And now, Lord, if we know you, if we're a true sheep, then our heart's going to break when your heart breaks. And we just give ourselves to you, Lord, and I know if we yield to you in this, you said our light's going to shine. You're going to lift us up. You're going to ride on the high place of the earth. That's where I want to live, Lord. I don't want to live in the world of selfishness. So thank you for your goodness. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. May this be a week where you feed the Spirit, and it might help the fast. And, um, and when you're confronted with choices between selfishness or dying to self, doing what you want, or being a light and caring for people, that you put people first, and that you experience God's goodness and his power flowing through you. So God bless you. Let's stand for the last song.
God bless you guys and have a great week.